if everyone could uh, have a seat again, please. We're going to recommence now. Because of our time factors and the fact that we began a little bit late, uh, we are not going to take the lunch break as announced in the original program. So for those of you who may be participating with the webcast, uh, please be advised you may not want to take a, a lunch break uh, in quite the manner prescribed. We will be uh, having a lunch brought in, and those who wish to can take a break um, at their convenience, but our talks and questions will be proceeding during the time period when some of us will be hopefully dining <laughs> quietly. Uh, Dr. Mossman. Everything go right? Yeah, okay. Um, my assignment today is to tell you what I don't know about the denomination of the St. Patrick copper and silver coins. Since no reliable paper trail exists to help me, my only option is to follow the advice of Polonius. By indirections, find directions out. And I have to search for my answers by examining the coins themselves. Now I have to start with the premise that no token coinage would ever be produced at a financial loss to its sponsor. And uh, let me look now for the first clue by, of where these, what these denominations were by examining the expenses needed to put a coin in circulation. Uh, th this is noted on the slide would be the uh, planchet cost, the, the mint costs, the fees for storage, transportation, distribution, profit, fees, bribes, and whatever, and the exchange rates of currency between England and Ireland. Realize that Ireland basically was treated as a colony of England, and the money did not, uh, uh, was not at par with uh, English money at any time uh, during that period, and uh, thus we have to, uh, calculate the differences in the, um, in the uh, exchange rates. Um, now, um, by estimating these items, we can get some idea of the minimum rate for which the St. Patrick series was originally intended to pass. Now, this is irrespective of the coin size relationships. And as in an email, Robert Heslip said to me that size relationships may not or do not equate with value. And the word originally is very important here uh, since their anticipated exchange rate may have changed over time due to legal or economic pressures. So some of these fixed costs such as transportations, commissions, bribes, the price tag for getting them into circulation may never be known. But fortunately, the mint costs can be estimated by examining uh, tower mint records for similar coinages. So basically, we are left with two equations. Uh, the first, to get the minimal, minimum in, intended denomination, uh, we have the uh, three factors to consider. And uh, in, uh, in figuring out the planchet cost, what we have to do is find out what the planchet weight is going to be and multiply that by the uh, cost of the, of the metal. Um, and to figure out the planchet costs, uh, as I say, the weight is very essential uh, for this, uh, to fit into this uh, uh, formula. But we do not have any uncirculated St. Patrick's right from the mint to be able to weigh them to get some idea what the average uh, mint weight would be. And certainly there are no records which would help provide this information. Now the question comes up, and this is one that I have pondered over for a number of years. Can we get reliable weight data from measuring the weights of circulated coins and extrapolate it backwards to get some idea what the actual uh, right off the press weight is going to be. And calculations have shown 
which I will go into in detail, that fine to very fine graded coppers uh, lose an insignificant amount of weight when compared to their mint state examples. Now I have data from Mason's Mills coppers, Massachusetts cents, Lincoln cents, and American large cents which confirm this hypothesis. Um, and I took the uh, grade of fine as a common benchmark, which we will be seeing. Now, the thing is, and as we just were discussing with Ray Williams last night, worn coppers lose weight, but not because copper has been abraded from the surface of the coin. Um, I'm sorry, coppers lose grade, not because the uh, the copper has been abraded from the surface of the coin, but it has been peened into the surface of the coin, so you lose the fine detail. So even though a coin may be uh, a lower grade, it could be the same weight or nearly the same weight as an uncirculated brother or sister. Um, now looking at these uh, Lincoln cent data, and this is from the um, CNL. This is work that uh, Skip Smith, uh, my alter ego, did with uh, measuring um, of each grade uh, 50 uh, Lincoln cents. And these are Lincoln cents prior to the war, so you don't have any shell case pennies amongst it. I mean, you've got basically pure copper. And what we see here is when you get down to fine, you've barely lost a half a percent in weight because the detail has been compressed into the surface. Then in the um, uh, book, I'm certain now that Roger participated in this, in the Damon Douglas book, uh, where he, where, where Douglas himself looked at um, large cents from uh, 1817 and 1851, uh, and these being a larger coin, he again made a very similar study. And for the larger coins, a fine coin would lose two and a third percent weight. But really, it's nothing, nothing uh, dramatic. Then when we get to Massachusetts cents, which are about the, be about the same size as a large cent, or only a little bit lighter, we see, again, for a fine, using this as a benchmark, we're down to just a little bit over 2.5% of weight loss when we're down to the uh, grade of fine. And then a study which I had done earlier on Mason's Mills, here your fine coins basically weigh more than what we would have assigned as a full weight. Now, if you look at the latest, if you look at the latest colonial newsletter, uh, Jack Howes in his article came, comes up with a, about with a different um, sample, comes up with almost the exact same numbers that I found. And the thing about Masons is that they're very shallowly engraved to make them look worn, and so you don't nearly have to uh, lose as much uh, copper, let's say, or peened for the uh, grade to be, uh, to be less. Now let me run back to something here which I neglected to tell you. Here with the Damon Douglas data, uh, I use these percentages as a correction factor um, because they are large copper coins and so I would, if I wanted to uh, extrapolate what a fine coin would, well, I mean, what a uncirculated coin would be, I would add this 2.38% for the sake of argument to get back to what we might re consider a mint weight specimen to be. Now, what is this weight versus grade data for the large St. Patrick's coin? You notice I avoid calling these things half pennies. They are the large St. Patrick coin. Okay, run right down it. And what do we see? Um, we have, I added up extra fines and very fines. I got 28. Um, very, in fact, there's not weight loss. Uh, the average of this is a little bit more than, um, I'm sorry, I'm on the fine one. Um, in order to extrapolate this back to full weight, uh, 
I added a 1.3% uh, uh, to the um, to the fines. Uh, with this number here, I basically combined the two groups, and I came up with 144 grains. And it's something very interesting that that is the same number um, that uh, was in a, Dr. Achilles Smith's 1854 paper of the fine specimens that he had, he came up to 144.75. So I have some confidence in this number. And also the ones that Crosby weighed, um, his heaviest example was 144 grains. So I think that's a pretty good ballpark figure. And I feel assured because Roger is nodding his head in agreement. <laughs> Now, let's see what happens when we get to the small St. Patrick coppers. Um, what I find here is that the finds look at the tremendous loss of weight these have as they reduce in grade. These coins are not copper. They are some alloy yet to be defined. I don't know what they are. Speculate they might be tin. Uh, in there. Um, my friend Skip Smith, who is a physicist, has the machine that can measure this, but it does not have its uh, uh, radioactive element has to be replaced. Uh, so we, we wanted to have this available for this meeting, but I'm afraid you'll just have to stay tuned. But anyway, this measures uh, 236 um, total. Now, I was very, um, I relied a lot on the C4 auctions on the Griffey uh, uh, sales because as I went back and measured these before, I was getting the pristine examples from Norweb and Garrett and Roper and all that, which were really in great shape. Uh, John Griffey and others who have been studying this series have been studying the whole series. They are not cherry picking. They are looking at the coins as they exist. And so uh, looking at those in the, in the two, basically two, possibly three catalogs, um, I was excluded 36 coins because they were so, so porous. I just wasn't going to trust their weights. The other thing which was fascinating is the number of people who tried to remove the gold splasher and how they dug the thing out. And this sort of settled my idea as to what that, that splasher was sort of applied on the surface as a bubble probably and then struck. But you know, it took a lot of effort to do that. So these coins were not struck cheaply. There have had to been some, some uh, foresight in doing this. Um, the, let me see, there was another point. Oh, yeah, and to, and to arrive at a full weight, what I had to do was apply the finagle factor here and get the three top grades. I could get 94 of them. And these, um, uh, this was their percent weight loss. And then using the Damon Douglas correction factor, I came up with a 95.9% uh, uh, grains as a normal weight. Now, if I can find my, my point here. Um, people may ask, and I will answer it before you ask it, what about the brass splasher? Well, brass has a specific gravity of 8.4 to 8.7. Copper is from 8.9 to 8.95. So the brass really would not make any probably appreciable difference in the weight, except if people tried to dig it out. And of course, I excluded all of those coins. And from, this, from the 23 EF and AU, these showed no porosity. And this is their percentage of uh, weight loss from this theoretical um, uh, full weight. And this uh, really is a number that, that really corresponds well with what uh, Damon Douglas did with his large coppers. Um, now, 
the really surprising thing is that these, these St. Patrick's, the small ones, do not follow this weight versus grade expectation that we find for the other um, copper coinages, and they lose mass much faster as the grade is decreased. And here I'm trying to find a weight so as that I can multiply at times the uh, price of copper to find out how much these things uh, uh, cost to mint. And as I said, and I was doing this, I stumbled upon my own mythical lame one-eyed camel, and this is what I came up with. What are these things made of? And why is there so much porosity? And really what we need is a high, is the non-destructive uh, planchet analysis. Uh, now in, um, when I discussed this with Oliver back a while ago, he said, well, why don't you do a graph to see whether we have two planchet populations? So there is a graph done here, but the point is there's, it's two peaked, but these peaks correspond with grade. They don't correspond uh, with um, just run-of-the-mill planchets because the fines basically are in this category and the very fines are in the second peak. And in a different, in a different um, presentation, you can see this very accurately that all of the um, peaks uh, correspond basically to grade and not to weight. So we have a grade issue here. And if I have the slide, yes I do. I was very impressed with the porosity seen uh, as described by the catalogers. Now looking back, it would be Tom Ronaldo was the only person who did the C4s and Michael Hodder would have been the only person doing the, um, uh, well he did a, a lot, um, I don't know. Yes, I guess he did them all with, 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 the, with the Roper, with the, um, not the Roper, with the um, uh, Garrett and Norweb sales. So you, you have a, two single observers. You don't have everybody and their uncle describing whether this is porosity or not. And anyway, um, what I did was to go through the more recent ones. These were all graded by Tom. And so these numbers don't correspond with the numbers here. And he noted the word porosity, microscopic, light porosity, severe, whatever. If that word came up, I made a note of it here. Never was it discussed in the EFEAU uh, specimens. In the, uh, in the very fines, a quarter of them, this was mentioned. In the, very, in the fines, 44%, very good 56%, and in the um, three top grades combined, again, it was a quarter, and um, in these excluded ones, of course, it was 100%. So what about these things that causes this very premature senescence of the surface for these uh, to, to become uh, porous? I frankly uh, don't know. I. It's not on the slide, but I got into a um, hoard that, of uh, Woods Hibernia coppers that was uncovered at Pemaquid in Maine, and these were brand new coins that were jettoned or thrown away, or they found them in the outhouse when this colony um, was disbanded in 1737, and that fits in so well with Brian Danforth's hypothesis of when these coins arrived here. This colony only lasted for two years, and all these good high-grade coins were found in the ground, and all of these had lost considerable amount of weight from porosity, but if you looked at them, you could see that they were high-grade to start with, and we did not, with that loss of, of weight, did not nearly parallel the, what is happening to the um, small St. Patrick's. So anyway, in trying to solve one problem, I came up with another, and that is the definition of serendipity and the lame one-eyed camel. Uh, now let us uh, compare all the coins that I've just spoke about. Small sense, large sense, mass, Masons, large St. Patrick's, 
small St. Patrick's, and just compare them. It is uncanny, and there's a, there's a, there's a fair number. So I think we have a good, a good sampling error, a good sample, um, I hope not a sampling error. Um, okay, so um, what I have done is also I have shot myself in the foot. <laughs> because in trying to figure out how much these things cost to mint to get some idea of the minimum amount that they could circulate for, I have to use values for copper. And I've already told you I don't think these are copper. And uh, so I have to uh, fit the, the Planchet data into the... Um, Oh, here, my, these are my, my new problems. What are they made of? Why do they lose so much weight? Why do they become porous? And here's my problem, my shooting myself in the foot. I'm basing my expenses on pure copper, and I've just said I didn't think they were. Now, we can go back to the Tower Mint. Now, um, I don't know whether, I guess Lou has published this, on the, um, of the Baltimore denaria were being printed, printed, were being, um, that was yesterday, they were being uh, minted by um, personnel of the mint, but, uh, of the tower mint, but maybe not in the mint. And so we have some ideas of the copper price that they had to pay. And we got this down to, um, well, see here are the weights that we decided on. And we've got it down to the amount of money. The copper would be 12 pence a pound, planchet manufacturer of uh, four pence halfpenny, die striking distribution, tuppence halfpenny. And so the, the total expense would be 19 pence English, 20.1 uh, Irish to accommodate for the exchange rate of 105.56. Irish to 100 English. Um, so now I'm back to where I started from before I found my mythical lame one-eyed camel. And here are our, uh, getting back to the metal costs. And this is what they cost to make. And putting this back into a chart, <coughs> I figured out that the large St. Patrick's could be produced at a potential profit of to 20.9%. If the small ones circulated as a farthing, there would have been a 9.2% loss. And if they were made primarily as a halfpenny, there would be an 81.6% profit. Now, um, oops, page is stuck here. Um, now, um, Robert just talked about other coins in Ireland at the time. So in other words, what were the Irish, what would they expect their small coins to be? And these are ones that he had talked about. Uh, this is the Armstrong leg pattern for the Charles II halfpenny. Uh, these are our friends right here. This is the earlier uh, Sir Thomas Arm uh, Armstrong, his farthing. And this is its size. Now, the patent farthings, the Maltravers, Lennox, Richmond, and whatever, are the same uh, diameter, but this one is significantly heavier. It's, it's, it's thicker. And here are Queen Elizabeth I, her minted money to pay her troops. This was a penny, and this was a halfpenny. Uh, these were things that he has just spoken about. Now, let's look at their weights. Um, and we get some idea, but I guess from what he has now told us that we can basically, except for the oval Harringtons, which were the later issues, because remember the, the first Harringtons that came out were tiny little things, and they were basically rejected right across the board. And so they made them a little bit larger, uh, but they were you know, nine grains, and the Lennox, and the Richmonds, uh, the Rose, which I guess we can discount and these were the Armstrong farthings, considerably heavier. Uh, now, Mick Wilson, this Mick drove me crazy until I found out it's the abbreviation for Michael. 
And so here's Nick Wilson with his 1762 halfpenny token, uh, and this is its size. The Dublin halfpenny, which um, Robert just has told us about, is a pretty hefty coin. And then the Charles II arms, well, they, these sort of uh, come afterwards, but uh, this was the regal halfpenny. My particular one that you saw the picture of is, is 122 grains, but they were authorized at 110 grains. <laughs> but let's look at, uh, we're making, jumping that these were made in England because Robert has told me there really wasn't much of a copper industry in Ireland at that time, if, unless you've discovered it in the last uh, two weeks. <laughs> um, <laughs> you see, the profit for Elizabeth's half penny is over a thousand percent. I mean, that's more obscene than a drug company. Uh, I mean, uh, the Peyton farthings, 867 percent profit. The Armstrong farthing, 335. The Charles II uh, was 58.2 um, percent. So these were not made at a loss. And I cannot imagine any businessman or token maker at the time uh, going in the hole for making uh, tokens that had no idea of redemption. See, see none of these uh, were basically redeemable in anything except, if, uh, except by, uh, by decree. And now we sort of getting down to the idea. This is what was circulating. Now, what did people contemporaneously say about this, these St. Patrick coins, which are very involved, they're very, I would say, complicated coinage. What did they say about them? And to me, it's incredible that there's no folklore about it, that grandmother didn't tell somebody about it or may have written about it, uh, that th these things sort of fell like manna from heaven. I mean, we don't know what the etiology of them is. Uh, so, so what if people said, what, what little do we know? Well, the first thing is 1679, the Act of Tinwald, and they were called halfpennies and farthings. <laughs> Sir Thomas Dinley was a Yorkshireman who traveled through Ireland. He was almost like uh, Sarah Knight on her trip through New England. Uh, and he kept, he was a very good artist and he made beautiful drawings of things that he found. And we're trying to find, Mike Hodder had this um, reference, and Mike cannot remember where he found it. And Lou has gotten the books in his capacity at Notre Dame University, <coughs> trying to find out more about Sir Thomas Dinley. But he saw the large coin, and he called them a halfpenny. So at least they were around in 81. Well, we know they were there in 79, in, in, in 81. And he called them the larger one. So if there's a larger one, there has to be a smaller one. Uh, 1682, something was passing in West Jersey as a halfpenny. But we don't know which coin it is. Nobody has really defined what it is yet. Um, then Archbishop Sharp called them half pennies and farthings, thorns be, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> You've got to be careful that some of these people may not be repeating what somebody else said. And, you know, uh, the literature is full of that sort of thing, and you've got to go back to the original source. But our friend, uh, Dean Jonathan Swift, told, called the, in his... Um, um, in his diatribe against uh, uh, Wood, uh, talks about the small coin which now passes for a farthing. And if he said it now passes, that means at one time it didn't pass for a farthing. That's what <laughs> but anyway, uh, Leak, again, all these people, uh, what they were saying. Harris says afterwards, but I guess in 1745, he was parroting what someone else said. Uh, I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't put too much in that. These fellows all here, again, I think, may have parroted each other, but they called them pennies or halfpennies. Aquila Smith was the only honest person there who said, I don't know. 
and then whoop, 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 and then we go hear that Clay in his uh, um, paper that has been on the internet uh, talking about the act of Tinwold uh, in the Isle of Man said that in 1670 there were pence and halfpennies in one place, farthings and, and half pence in another. And I'm taking the prerogative of the speaker to ask Robert a question here. The Isle of Man was English at that point, or was it Irish or independent? Okay, well, I got the answer that it was probably more Irish than English, so that would mean that English exchange rates would apply because they really, they get rid of the um, St. Patrick's tokens which, which circulated there in favor of the uh, um, English and in favor of another token um, which was um, backed that, that, that there, was some, um, there was some sponsorship from it and the, and the coins were, uh, were basically guaranteed. And of course, this would tell us right now that the St. Patrick's coinage did not have a guarantor if they, if they did not allow them to circulate in favor of one that did have a guarantor. But anyway, that's my speculation. And then we, whoop, we get down to um, Michael Dolly. Um, and we heard today that this is, uh, he was been sort of called the Dean of Irish Numismatists and also the, the teacher of, of Robert, that he, he said that we don't know that these aren't half groats and pennies. And they could have changed, uh, they could have been re-tariffed anywhere along the line. We just don't know that. Uh, so next, uh, we know that, that, that Mark Newby picked up a bunch of these and he took them to West Jersey uh, where they were authorized the following year. Now, to, to me, it seems that Mark Newby was a very fast-acting politician. He arrives there one year, gets in the legislature, and then monetizes his, his pocket change to pass at 24 to the West Jersey shilling. And then we hear that when he died, that the, his estate had to make good for 30 pounds redeeming them. And the problem I've always had with this is what is the fate of these redeemed tokens? They didn't pick them up and toss them overboard because that area had such a coinage shortage. So it really, to me, never made any sense that they were redeemed. Uh, because what are they going to spend? Well, anyway, we now have uh, from um, um, coin detectors found six of the small ones in copper and one silver one. And um, as far as others that have been found, what about the large ones? There have been none found to my knowledge. Now, in Crosby, he, the, uh, the citation that Crosby uh, mentions is that these halfpence were found over um, Mark Newby's original farm. Well, of course they were halfpence because that's what they were tariffed as. So, uh, but they do not describe, and this is another thing we've been looking for, trying to get this original reference as to what was actually found. Did they make any description of what they were? But as it is, I mean, you can't, you can't fault anybody for calling them halfpennies because that is precisely what they were. Um, now we are on to the other um, topic, and that is the silver um, of the coins of this denomination. And while we know very little about the coppers, we know less about the silver. Um, and this is what they have been variously uh, presented as. Uh, the first one, um, we know that this was first mentioned 
uh, back in the um, late 1600s. So there is the theory that these were re-strikes uh, coeval with the, um, uh, with the re-striking of the gun money, but th these were described almost, uh, these were described back in the, in the reign of Charles II. And I was able to locate and, in fact, um, Robert Heslip gave me a whole list of people to write to and get hold of, and I basically didn't find any of them. The, the, the English had absolutely no interest in these, and the only ones in the British Museum were copies. And so I could not get any weights, and I could get 29 weights, and they averaged 102 grains. Now the thing about this, and I don't have the slide of it, there's a very, very wide weight distribution, and you know that because of the up, because of the second standard deviation, uh, the second standard deviation here of 11.2 era. This is indicative of a very wide range, and. Robert, again, being in, in charge of hordes in the Ulster Museum, gave me a number of Charles II, yeah, Charles II, Charles I? Charles I, uh, silver shillings, and they did not nearly have this um, era. So we know that those that were, and they could have had a little bit of clipping on those, and we know that, um, that these, St. Patrick's ones were all over the place. They could not have been the products of a carefully minted, uh, uh, of, of careful minting, um, because the, the regal ones do not jump all over everywhere. And then if you look at the mass silver, there is a very narrow range there. I mean, with his, with his scissors and whatever, uh, Holland Sanderson, really uh, had a very, very tight range of their silver. Of course, they were Yankees and they were gonna get every bit out of it they could, but nonetheless. And then we, we um, look at the English shillings of the period were 92.9 grains. This is our exchange rate. Therefore, a theoretical Irish shilling would have weighed 88 grains. These were 14 too heavy or 13.7 uh, overweight. They were essentially an Irish 14 pence piece. Now, if that is a shilling ever hit the Irish shore, its first and only stop would have been the melting pot because those have been put into bullion and exported faster than you could wink your eye. So anyway, that is where we're at and we um, also have uh, two gold specimens, one made from um, small coin dyes, and the other one I think is just sort of made out of whole cloth somewhere. Uh, and uh, it's, it it's, um, wouldn't be a fantasy piece, but it would be a fabrication. Now, now in summary, what do we know? There's no clear-cut evidence as to denomination, but there's a lot of guesses. Tradition, iconology, splasher, and whatever links the large and the small coins. We don't even know if they were from the same sponsor. We're just guessing. Um, and as Robert also told me in a, in a email, the um, issue that one is almost twice the weight of the other, uh, don't pay too much attention to that because the weight relationship would not nearly be uh, uh, as important. Uh, the, uh, the other point, too, is that the full weight coin, I'm guesstimating at 144, their grade to weight loss behavior is like all other coppers. Oh, my slide had a little seizure here. Um, they were minted at a fair profit of 20.9%. And there's no current evidence that these circulated in West Jersey. Now in the small ones, they've only been considered farthings because of their size. Uh, it, it, not any weight relationship, they have no weight relationship to the large coin. They are one to 1.5 rather than a one to two relationship. Tradition links them together. As farthings, they were mended at a loss. 
They're, they lose weight rapidly and become porous. They don't act like copper. I don't know what they are. A mint state is 95.9. The only ones recovered in West Jersey. And I just think they were originally half pence then, then, that then got made into uh, uh, farthings. And that would have been at a considerable loss. As far as the silver and off metal specimens, uh, they're not shillings. They're all struck from original dyes except for two examples. And there's also one, and maybe there's two large silver ones. I, I know of one because Aquila Smith had one. It was 175 grains uh, uh, of silver for a large one. There's one lead trial piece. And the, also the question has been raised whether these were struck later as, Irish, uh, as the Irish gun money. Now, in conclusion, I haven't helped you one bit, and I've just muddied the waters, and it reminded me of this quotation from the nuclear physicist Enrico Fermi, who concluded after delivering a complicated lecture, before the talk, I was confused about the subject. I'm still confused, but at a higher level. This is a good segue for the next speaker, who will certainly relieve you of all your doubts. Thank you. <laughs> Dear, I didn't expect the question. <laughs> I, uh, I plead the fifth. <laughs> I, I've always kind of been curious. There's a, a separation of perhaps 30 to 40 years, depending on if you count the pre patents, between the uh, St. Pat's and the Woods pieces. Uh, it's not, not the Woods, the Woods Roses, not the Hibernias. The Woods Roses were brought over in, in uh, 1722 against a pre-patent of 1717. And clearly the Rosa halfpenny pieces are slightly less than the, than the St. Pat's. Could not that be a, an argument also that, that they would have been accepted as a, as a halfpence here? Except they had silver in them. Not the the. They had bath metal, and bath metal had the silver. The bath metal had like what, point one percent silver. Well, it was, I thought it was five percent. No, no. It was a point one. It was a very, very insignificant amount. Yeah, well, of course, you also realize that the Rosa Americana series did not circulate very well because people were really be taken, really being taken for a ride, uh, as far as as value goes, and they were not what I would call a successful coinage. Now, in the paper I gave yesterday, when I didn't get, I gave the paper, the paper money part, but in the coinage part, the Rosa Americana patent actually had a phrase in it outlawing their counterfeiting. And what I did in my other paper was to make a statement that this was an unsuccessful coinage, so nobody would counterfeit a dog. You know, they, they were, they were, so I, I don't think that, I wouldn't have said that they were a good circulating coinage, although I have found them from Prince Edward Island all the way down to New Jersey. So and, I can't answer your question. And, and I, think, I think if I, memory serves me correct, that the, the roses, the, the halfpenny roses are in around 62 grains or something like that. So they're actually a bit less than the same pants? Probably, I, I do have those data, but I, I have, I have lost them with the passage of years. <laughs> I'd have to look it up. <laughs> but that's a very good point. It's a very good point. Um, and to give Mr. Wood his due, I think his halfpennies and farthings were of very acceptable weight for the period. Yes, Will, I think it's Will, is it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, on the, uh, chart, uh, on the uh, chart of uh, weight distributions that you said was actually skewed because of the different grade levels yeah. a while ago, I was wondering if it would be worthwhile to normalize each of those values based on your wear adjustments and your porosity adjustments and then do a plot and just see what that looked like if you had two peaks or one peak. Oh, what you mean would be to redo the chart based on porosity rather than grade or No, sir. Uh, apply your adjustments, uh, the Damon Douglas adjustments and all, all to each of the, the, the point values, then replot it to see what the, 
what, what a normalized view of that. Oh, be. I see what you mean. Yeah, you could do that as long as you were convinced they were copper. I would think we'd have to get an analysis first. I had one of those which I had done a specific gravity on, and all the specific gravity, it won't help you if it's, if it's normal. It will only help you if it's abnormal because you don't know what goes in to make up the specific gravity. In fact, it's, let's say it could be tin and lead that might come out to be exactly what copper would be, for example. So you, so, um, you could get some combination if you had a real complex alloy. But I think that's a very good point in that should be done when we can, can get, a, um, get an analysis. Yeah, thank you. Good suggestion. Question, yes, David. Is it, safe, oh, sorry. is it safe to assume, I mean, you're talking about uh, farthings to half pennies, half pennies to pence, uh, half groats to pence, and so forth, that whatever value these two coins, uh, two types of coins may have had, it would be one to two, even though their weights are not one to two? Well, this is apparently, this is the fact that they did have a one to two relationship no matter what it was. But of course, I think it was a one to one when they started out. Just as a sort of a straw vote, um, am I pipe dreaming or does that sound reasonable that it was a one to one? Show of hands. Oh, oh, thank you, Robert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Brian, I, th I can barely see from here, but I think it's Brian. I've always uh, noticed that on the Irish uh, tokens of the period, um, in, um, most of the uh, tokens, the number one in terms of denomination, when they appear as a denomination, they're listed as a penny. And the next would be a half penny, and very rarely would be as farthings. Mm -hmm. A little different from England, where the halfpenny played a much larger role as a denominational token. Um, and it always, I don't know if you've given any thought that um, whether uh, St. Patrick's may have been following uh, the tradition, really, of, of the halfpenny penny. Um, you mean there's more of the English mode than the Irish mode? More of the Irish mode is the trade tokens of the 60s, uh, 1650s and 1660s, the Irish trade tokens by denominations that were listed were predominantly uh, pennies and half pennies. But you, also, but you also noticed that, um, Oliver, did, did Brian's comment go out over the airways to everybody? I don't have to repeat it then. No. Okay. Um, but, the, um, but the other thing is, Brian, that many of those also had the denomination on them, like so-and-so his half penny, so-and-so his penny. And, and these are mute, completely mute as to what they are. And this is the thing that has, you know, has basically befuddled me, how a coinage that has so many die varieties could have existed in limbo and nobody knows or really gives a darn until we 2006 uh, COAC. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, 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 did, yeah, Roger. Just, you know, the, uh, I wonder where we're left with the silver, let's call it shilling. It's, you know, given the weight and your point about the, the first thing that would happen would be it would be melted. I mean, any, any conjecture? And then uh, one thing I was thinking about, too, is that they largely come, I mean, the ones I've seen, come in kind of better EF to AU Unkish. They all tend to be fairly well preserved. Any kind of speculation on what they might be? Well, I think the, the two highest speculation would be metal or a presentation piece. But presentation to whom? Well, if they're a presentation piece, then that begs the question of, you know, they had to be prolific enough and important enough that we ought to know something about the farthing or after ah. the recipient. I know what, 
just dawned on me. They were made by the people who made the continental dollar. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that answer. Um, any comment on that, Robert? Uh, as to what these things might be? I, I, I would be very, very, very wary about regarding them as having any currency uh, significance at all. And I think they're awfully like those so-called gun money proofs. Um, it should also be remembered that there are quite a number, uh, a sort of disproportionate number of silver specimens of the Irish uh, Ibneys, uh, the regal Ibneys. I mean, it, to me, very, object very subjectively, there's a much greater number of so-called silver proofs of that coinage than there is of the equivalent English one. I mean, the, Engli the English, the, the, the old uh, silver English hit in the period, but they're really, really quite rare, whereas the, mm. the Irish ones turn up with some frequency, mm. so, which fits in with the idea of, of an informal mint. Uh, but, I mean, I, my money would, would lie, sort of, if I, if I was forced in it, to thinking that they were struck possibly at the same time as the gun money examples as curiosities. That, that explains why, the, why they're not worn. Um, that explains why there's a number of different dyes, um, etc. Uh, you know, and why, why they, they, the weights are so various because they've been struck on whatever was available rather than on, on a currency planchet, which is uh -huh. regularity and uh, consistency. Somewhere in my notes, I'll have to get the first appearance and the mention of the silver St. Patrick's, but it was during the reign of Charles II. E e yeah, so, but the other ones, of course, the gun money would have been, would have been his, um, would have been his successor, would have been James II. You mean you mean the uh, the the proofs and whatever? Yeah. No. I'm okay. Yeah. Said. It would seem to me that the silver would have to be uh, met almost contemporaneously with the, the copper pieces, and the reason for that is that at the time dyes wouldn't have lasted 20 years without rusting, and, and the silver halfpennies or the silver farthings, shillings, whatever, uh, they don't come rusted. They have very very nice uh, fields. Yep. They have very nice planchets. And I don't believe any of the dyes at all would have lasted 20 years without having rust pits. And also to add to that, Jim Lasser has um, a silver from the same dye that shows dye wear. Yeah, I have pictures that he did um, showing that. Big pardon? That gets you back to more presentation. Yeah, yeah. Well, if we knew a lot about it, we wouldn't have to come to New York and, and Armistice Day. Oh, no, yeah, Armistice Day, yeah. Yes, sir, Dickon. Just a question about the, 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 you're trying to backtrack and figure out the weight of the, the small and the large module ones, and you're comparing them to the machins, which... I don't think your microphone is on. Did you hit the switch? Did you turn it off? Hello? The, the Machins were struck to any weight standard, and the Massachusetts coppers, I believe, were struck so many to the pound. And yeah. the, the no, no, Massachusetts were struck per. Per? Yeah, not per pound, because it was a, it was a federal standard, the same as the Fujio, 157.5, although they didn't come up to it. Because those are some of your uh, recent Ford coins. I got every uncirculated mass I could run into, or every high quality. And uh, that was in that last, um, that, that computation. And I retract my question. Oh, which US I didn't ones, get. Then the U.S. ones also, I believe, are struck per, so. Yeah, yeah all the U.S. are struck per, but the Irish and English were usually struck um, so many per pound. So you could, um, Basically, it made it a lot easier because, it's, you know, they didn't have to have the tight quality control for token coinage that 
the royalty was giving to the common people just out of their God-given benevolence. I mean, they, they really didn't think much of the common people uh, with the um, uh, supplying them with appropriate money to wit the patent farthings. <laughs> okay, let me get out of your way here. <laughs> Uh, we're, we've just run out of videotape, so we'll take a little, <laughs> we'll take a little break right now. Uh, the lunch has arrived. You can begin uh, attempting to serve yourselves. We will, however, not really take a break other than just to get our equipment reset, and we'll commence with uh, our next talk in just a few minutes.